wonderful to see you all. If you're new or visiting with us, it's lovely to have you here at Christchurch Cascades. My name's Richard, one of the pastors here. And we've been, um, we've been spending the, the first term, and we're going to be through the second term, meeting Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. And so we're kind of continuing our series. Um, bow with me. Let's pray. This is a, a really is a turning point in the Gospel of Mark as, um, as Jesus, he's shown us who he is. And now he's going to move into a section showing us how we're to follow after him. So let's pray and let's ask God to speak to us and teach us today. Father, thank you that you are a God who speaks and that you speak clearly to us. Thank you that we are not in the dark, um, but you have have spoken. Uh, Your word is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. And so by the power of your spirit, drive it into our hearts today. Teach us what it means to be your people so that we can walk into this week obediently following after Jesus uh, and use us, we pray. In his name we pray. Amen. I don't know what kind of child you were. You get all sorts, different personalities. I was an exceptionally compliant child, but I grew up with, uh, with extended family who weren't massively compliant. And um, I, I remember um, I, I, I woke up one morning, it was my 10th birthday, and I went through a, a, rebellious, a rebellious stage. I decided at age 10, I didn't need to have a mother anymore. That was it, I'm done. I mean, I still wanted to live at home, I mean, because I didn't want to cook or clean for myself, but I didn't need to be told what to do. I was double digits, time for me to start making my own decisions. And so everything my mom said to me on the 29th of August, 1994, was no. No, I won't brush my teeth. No, I'm not going to bath. No, I'm not going to wear that or eat that, or hang that up, or clean my room. It was short-lived because, um, like I said, I, I, had, um, I had extended family, like I said, who, who weren't hugely compliant and needed a little bit more of a stronger arm. And my, my aunt lived up the road. She was 500 meters away, and she heard how I had spoken to my mother that day. And her nickname was Auntie Dragon. And I remember, I remember her driving down the hill. She pulled me into the bathroom, gave me an attitude adjustment club, looked me in the eye and said, you never speak to your mother like that again. And that was it. The rebellious streak was over. Family hierarchy was restored. And I was reminded how I needed to act as a younger son towards a mother. If you don't understand a role, your role, and if you don't understand the role of those around you or above you, you're not going to know how, how you fit in the context here, in, in this context, the context of my family. So I knew I had a mother but then I, was, I, don't, I don't need mothering anymore. And so, so I was kicking against her. And that's kind of what we do. If we don't understand the people above us or around us, we're not going to know how we fit into the context of those relationships. And so you'll kick against, you'll ignore, or you'll be blissfully unaware of what your responsibilities are. And what we have here are the disciples. And the disciples, are, they, they've just started to figure out who Jesus is. Last week we saw Peter declares, you're the Christ. He's seen who Jesus is. He's recognized, and the lights are coming on. But we saw also last week that the lights are dim. Like the blind man in, in chapter 8, verse 24, who, who he, he, he needed a double healing. He, he was only half seeing at the beginning of that miracle. We see here Peter knows that Jesus is the Messiah, but he actually doesn't understand the role that the Messiah has come to do. So he got half of it. And if he doesn't know what Jesus has come to do, then he's not going to know how, he's gonna, how, how he needs to relate to Jesus as a disciple. If I push against my mother's role to be a parent, I'm not going to behave as a child should. And so if I have a wrong view of what messiahship is, then I'm not really going to understand discipleship. To put it another way, we will only understand our purpose as we understand Jesus and the mission that he's come to fulfill. Does that make sense? And and, and so Jesus showed us last week that the Messiah... He has come to rule Israel. He's come to destroy the Romans. He's come to gather an army to seize control of the world. Did he teach us that? No. It's not what he's come to do. That's what, that's what the disciples were hoping he was going to come do. That was the expectation. He tells us instead in verse 31, the Messiah came to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. Those are the religious people who should have recognized him. They will reject him, and he will be killed and rise after three days. Jesus' mission as God's mighty king was to come into the world and to die. And we saw last week, in order to take, to take the punishment that our sin deserved, he comes to redeem, he comes to heal our hearts and to open a way for us 
to experience and enjoy eternal life one day, as was just prayed for us by Glenn. That was his role. That was his mission. That was his purpose. And so the question is, what is ours? As we, as we stare at the Messiah, this Jesus, this long-awaited king who comes to die, how do we relate to him now as his disciples? Well, if I, wonder, I wonder if you notice in verse 34, Jesus now calls his disciples, and he calls the crowd around him. The word is actually much stronger than call. He summons them around him. He calls them together to listen to him. What he's about to reveal is critical for them to understand. If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In other words, being Jesus' disciples and following him means we will need to do the same things and experience the same things that Jesus faced. That's what he's telling us here, as we walk the same path that Jesus walked. That's why it's so important to know Jesus' role and why he came. Peter was kind of pushing against it. He didn't really understand it. It's because he, he didn't necessarily want to do those same things either. But we'll see here that we as Christians, we're going to do the same things. We're going to experience the same things. And so if we don't know that this is his role, we won't know ours. And, and I wonder if you notice there, those, in that verse there, he calls us to three things. Three things that we are required in discipleship following after Jesus. Did you see it? First, deny yourself. Deny yourself. Jesus is telling his disciples that in order to follow him, they're going to have to say no to themselves. There are things that we would like, things that we're going to want. There are going to be other paths that we're going to want to follow after. And Jesus says, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to have to follow me. We will have to choose his ways over our ways. Or to put it another way, Jesus must become the center of our lives. Our lives will orbit around him. If he is the king, if he is the Messiah, then we, we want to shape our lives to revolve around him and his plans and his kingdom. Secondly, not only will discipleship require us to deny, deny ourselves, we're also told it's going to be costly. You see what Jesus says there? That we're to take up our cross. Now, this phrase has been quite popular in Christian circles. It's, it's very Christianese. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you've heard the idea of picking up your cross and following after Jesus. It's kind of been a bit uh, desensitized a bit. You know? and, and so we, we can often speak about you know, when, the, when the Wi-Fi is a little bit slow at home, or you get sick and you, you, you miss a big event that you wanted to go to. Oh, this is the cross that I have to bear in life. You know? That's how we often speak. Not only do we, do we sense it, desensitize this expression, but we also generally, we have a very positive view of the cross. And in one sense, that's an okay thing, because we live this side of Jesus' death and resurrection. And so we've just celebrated two weeks ago, Good Friday. Uh, we see the good that Jesus achieved in and through him going to the cross. And so we see it as, a, as, as something to celebrate. And so we wear it on necklaces and jewelry. Um, some braver ones will get it tattooed on their arms. But to the disciples, Jesus calling them to take up their cross would have been a very hard thing for them to hear. It, it would have been boarding on scandalous, almost offensive, because they knew how bad crucifixion was. Think about what crucifixion means. It, it's a death sentence, but it was the worst way you could die. The crucifixion was a Roman torture machine. It was, it was developed to... to have the most maximum amount of pain, inflict the maximum amount of pain on people, and slowly. It was also a shameful way to die. It was publicly humiliating. It was, it was reserved for the worst of the worst of the worst criminals. What Jesus is calling his disciples to here is a willingness to not just give up your desires, but also a willingness to be publicly rejected and opposed because of him, even to the point of death. Now, these disciples... They will go on to experience this physically. Many of them would give up their lives. And, and many disciples have subsequently done that over the past 2,000 years. Us here in South Africa in 2024, we're unlikely to lose our lives because we follow after Jesus. Yet following after Jesus will certainly mean that our character, our reputation gets crucified. As we follow after Jesus, we'll find that it isn't the popular path to walk. Following Jesus is not the in thing to do. And we will get flack for it. We will be humiliated for it. We will suffer. Think about the cost of, of being honest, just for a moment, as, as an example. 
something that Jesus tells us to be, something that God loves. God loves a truthful people because he is a God who is truthful, one who doesn't lie. We are called to be lovers of what is noble and right and true. But being honest sometimes causes us, us to, to miss out on the things that we want. Denying self and the urge to win that job through a white lie here or overselling my capabilities here so that I can win the contract or get the job. Teens, for a moment, think about your social setting at school. When someone has done something that is serious and wrong, the pr pressure to deny yourself and speak against it is a difficult thing to do, isn't it? It's very hard. Because if you tell the truth, you might lose friends. They might even call you an unfaithful friend because you've chosen to do what is right. Because you didn't stand up for them, but you have stood up for the truth. See, these things are difficult, aren't they? As we, as we navigate what is true and right and to take up our cross. And so the temptation will be that we'll, we'll hide away. We'll want to do the easier thing. Uh, the easier thing of caving in and keeping quiet to live like the rest of the world, and to keep our discipleship a secret. Jesus here is calling his disciples to be different, and he's calling, he's calling his disciples to stand out, to openly identify with him, an opposed king, and to share in his rejection. That's why he goes on to say this in verse 35. He says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. He says, you can, you can try... Saving your life by hiding away, and you will. In the context of the example that we used, you, you, you might save your name, your reputation, for a little bit of time. But what then? You'll gain some popularity. For the disciples here, who their lives would have been threatened, they, they might have even gained a couple of extra years. But one day they would then stand, just like we're going to do, Stand before this Jesus, who we're told is the judge, one who is ruling and reigning. We'd stand before our maker, and we will lose out on life, eternal life. Jesus picks up on this idea in verse 38. He says this, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man, that's a title from the Old Testament of God coming into the world, this, this powerful figure of whom Jesus uh, is, this is a title for himself, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, we're all prone to feeling shame from time to time, aren't we? We're prone to feel embarrassed. He's not saying that if we ever feel shame, then we're going to miss out on eternity. He's warning us of allowing shame to lead us to reject Jesus outright and therefore miss out on real life. And so he's inviting us to do some simple accounting work. So bean counters, this is going to excite you over the next little bit. Have a look at verse 36 and, seven, 36 and 37. He says this, for what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet lose his life? And what can anyone give in exchange for his life? Following Jesus and the rejection that it brings is hard. It's a hard thing. It's a it's a, it's a difficult road to walk, but it far outweighs the alternate option. You can gain the whole world, and think of it as the, I was never great at accounting, but think of the credit column, right? You have a credit in stuff column. You have loads of things. So imagine for a moment you don't deny yourself, and you chase after all that your heart desires, and you gain many things. You can have credits in another column, in terms of popularity, where you don't offend anybody, you just go with the flow. But even though you may be wealthy in your stuff, you may be wealthy in friends, what can you give in exchange for your soul, asks Jesus. Where it says there, uh, what can anyone give in exchange for his life? The word there is soul. What can you buy? You can't, use to, you can't, you can't trade your things in or popularity to trade it off to buy eternal life. Jesus is saying to us that although it's not easy, it makes sense to follow after him because he is leading people to eternal life. If you, want to if you want to try and save your life, you will lose it, and you'll lose eternal life too. But if you lose your life for the sake of the gospel, he says you gain eternity. Steve Jobs, many of you will know him, inventor and founder of 
Apple, he did a speech, and it's a very famous speech, so you might have watched snippets of it online. He did, he, did a, he did a speech for Stanford University before he died in 2011. And he said this about the brevity of life. He says, remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment, all failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. And he's right in a certain sense, isn't he, there? He's right. When we consider that life is short and that death is approaching, it will help us think about what is really important. It helps change our priorities. It clears, it clears everything. It reorientates our goals and dreams. Steve Jobs unfortunately finishes the quote by saying this, remembering that you're going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. There's no reason not to follow your heart. For Steve Jobs, death was the end. And so don't let anybody tell you how to live. It's all you have. So follow your heart is his logic. And that's, that's the message of our time, right? Be true to yourself. Follow after your own dreams. Be whoever you want to be. Jesus tells us not to follow our own hearts. Follow him. Follow him. Rather deny yourself. Pick up your cross because he will lead us through death and into life. As, a, as another example of some, something somebody once said, Jim Elliott, he was a missionary, um, and he was a missionary in Ecuador, and he once wrote this, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. We cannot keep our lives. We are aging. Death is coming. You give what you cannot keep to gain what you cannot lose, denying ourselves and taking up our cross, according to Jesus, is the path to life. And so there's no more important thing in life and death than following Jesus. And he is calling us to join him. It's the third aspect of his call, if you like. Deny ourselves, take up our cross, and do you notice he says, follow me. Notice Jesus doesn't say, go and be crucified. He doesn't say, go and die. Go and deny yourself. It's follow me. Come with me. Die with me. He doesn't expect us to do anything that he's not willing to do himself. And something that he did do. This is the life Jesus lived. And he did it all on his own. Think about it for a moment. Of what Jesus did when he was here. Rejected by his own people. Betrayed by his own friends. Peter, we're going to have a look at now in, in chapter 9. He's given us this glorious vision of Jesus. Rejects him for a time. He was, he was called all kinds of terrible names as he spoke the truth. He was tried as a criminal. He was nailed to a cross. And there we see on the cross, he's even abandoned by God the Father. He denied himself. Do, do you remember there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to God if there was any other way, any other direction in order to achieve his mission, if there's any other path to follow in order to rescue rebellious people, please take this away from me, he prays. And yet there was no other way. And so what does he do? He trusts God. He denies himself. He takes up his cross. And in doing so, he takes our place by facing death and judgment. So that when he rose, he would defeat death for us and give us life eternal. That's what it took. That's what it cost. And so Jesus now says, come and die with me. I have trailblazed through death. I've kicked down the door between this life and the next. Join me and let me guide you there. The path is a little bumpy, this side of eternity, but stick with me and you'll make it through. And here's where it gets even better. Our suffering and our shame and the difficulties that we'll face as we stand for Jesus is never a waste. We often think of it like that. We, you know, we live in a culture where we try and minimize suffering as much as we can. And in fact, here, if we suffer for Jesus and the gospel, it is never a waste. It has purpose. As we take a stand, as we choose to follow Jesus, as we deny ourselves and live differently, what does that result in? It results in us trusting God more and more, hoping in the promises, we're told in, in, in uh, Romans chapter 5, but also it results in the salvation of others as they watch. And how do people see Jesus? They watch the way we walk. 
Have a look at 1 Peter chapter 2. These will be familiar because uh, we've, we've spent some time at 1 Peter in our growth groups recently. Peter says, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles, already you see that's language of not fitting in to this world, to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against your soul, i.e., deny yourself, take up your cross. Don't follow your heart is what Peter's saying here. Verse 12, what does that look like? Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles. Those are the non-Christians. So that when they slander you as evil do, even though you're doing what is good, they'll look at you and go, you're evil. That's, terrible. That's a terrible thing you're doing. Teens, like I was saying a little bit earlier, there you stand for what is true. They'll go, oh, you're unfaithful. But actually, what you're doing is a good thing, right? They will say that you are evil, even when you're doing good things. And yet, what is that? how does that outwork? So that they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And not just for us, but for the sake of others. And so if we haven't understood Jesus' mission, if we don't see what he has come to do and how he lived and died and rose again to save, we're not going to understand our role to follow after him. Now, his disciples haven't witnessed all that Jesus is going to do and the lengths to which he is going to suffer and serve them. They've got an idea of who he is. They've seen him do these powerful miracles. But in chapter 9, Jesus moves on and he takes his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, up a very high mountain to show off his glory. And we get to witness that this afternoon. We get to see a little picture of who Jesus is, the veil of who Jesus is removed. Um, we don't have time to have, have a look at the whole of his transfiguration in depth, but he takes them up this high mountain, and um, mountains are very important in the Bible. So you'll know often when God meets with his people, it's on top of a mountain. We see this in Exodus. We see it often with the prophets. Um, and so Jesus heads up the mountain, and we're told there that he is transfigured. The, the word is metamorphone, where we get the word metamorphosis from. There he is, he is changed, is the, the language. We're told that the veil of who Jesus is pulled away and he shines. And Mark, you can see he's, he's trying to figure out how to describe this for us. And to the best he can come up with is um, he's, so, he's shining, his clothes are so white, it's like no other launderer can, can do. You know, the, he's, somebody has bleached his clothes very well. There is Jesus, God in the flesh, shining before them. And what is interesting is who appears with Jesus. You know, there's two other characters there. We're told Moses and Elijah are there with Jesus, talking with him. And we're not told what, the, what they were saying here in Mark, but in the, the account that Luke tells us, the, the transfiguration of Luke, in chapter 9, verse 31, says this. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So unsurprisingly, there is Moses, there's Elijah, and they're speaking with Jesus about what? Jesus' mission what Jesus is about to go and do, his role in denying himself and taking up his cross. Jesus wants to show his disciples that his plan is heaven sent, that this is what he needs to do. And having Moses there and Elijah shows them that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. So that's Moses is kind of a representative figure of all that is written in the law of God. And remember, Moses goes up the mountain to get the law. And here's Elijah, who's one who's almost a representative of the prophets. In other words, all of the Old Testament, everything that has happened so far, is pointing to this mission that Jesus has come to fulfill. But then if we, if we still have any kind of confusion, if Peter and James and John have any doubt, we're told this in verse 7, Mark chapter 9, verse 7, a cloud appeared, overshadowing them, and a voice came from the cloud, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Just like mountains were important in the Old Testament where God meets, there are often clouds that are there and rumbles and peals of thunder and lightning and voices speaking out of the cloud. Here is God speaking of his son, and what does he say? Listen to him. Listen to him. And as he says that, the cloud disappears, and there is Jesus, no longer in his laundered, bright, shining clothing, but he stands before his disciples, and the call for them, listen. And listen to what? What are they to listen to? Well, what he's just said. 
what he's just taught. If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And friends, that's his word to us this afternoon. Will we listen? Will we believe? Um, I just love how Jesus and his disciples were told that they head down the mountain. We don't have time to look at this much. Um, and it's really kind of a, we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up as we, um, as we think about the, the disciples' response to this call over the next couple of weeks. But Jesus heads down the mountain. There are his disciples. Um, like we've seen in the Gospels already, there's a, a demon-possessed child, and the f- a father of this child comes. And none of the disciples are able to deal with this demon, and the father begs Jesus for help. And Jesus says this in verse 23. Uh, the, the, they are, the, the, the father says, if you can heal him. And Jesus said to him, if you can, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the, boy, the father of the boy cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. And Jesus heals the boy. It's the reminder, again, of Jesus' power that we are to come to him in our weakness, even with our doubts and with our shame. And sometimes our embarrassment, the the mocking of those around us as we strive to follow Jesus ring loudly in our ears, doesn't it? Isn't it such a hard thing to do? We're discouraged often. Our hearts are discouraged as people reject us. We're tempted to think that Jesus isn't powerful. Is he really that big? Or has he forgotten us? Jesus takes the disciples up the mountain, and he's kept that for us, this word to us, to let the glory of Jesus, our life giver, remind us of his role and now our role, to follow after him. This passage, if you like, is is like my auntie dragon coming down the hill. It's a little bit of a rebuke, isn't it? Knock a bit of sense into me and maybe you this afternoon, but it's for our good, isn't it? It's discipline that pulls us back in line It puts Jesus back in the center of our plans, our decisions, our life. Let him guide you in how you speak. Let him guide you in how you love. Let him guide you in how you do relationships or parent or spend your money, how you use your time. We don't have a lot of it. We don't have a lot of time. Life is short. And as Jesus shapes you, people will think that you are crazy. They may even turn their backs on you. Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for Jesus to shine through you. Pray for opportunities to share why Jesus is your hope, why you live differently. And pray that God's Spirit will take the gospel of Jesus and drive it into their hearts so that they can gain eternal life too. And so perhaps this afternoon you need to realize maybe you need to put your faith in Him. Maybe you've been coming to church for a while. Maybe you're new to Christian things. And you've seen Jesus in all his glory and how he served you. Follow him to life is what he's calling you to today. If that's you, pray what the father of that child prayed in verse 24. I believe, help me in my unbelief. Ask Jesus to be your savior, to forgive you, thank him for serving you, that he would deny himself, take up that cross and join his mission and that road to eternal life. I'm going to pray for us as we get ready to to share in communion together, a sign that Jesus gave us to remember his mission. Let's prepare our hearts to enjoy his grace in the wafer and the cup. Let me pray for us. Father, what a joy to receive your word. Although the call this afternoon is not an easy one, Thank you that we follow Jesus who has walked the road before us and that by the power of the Spirit, he is with us. Thank you that he denied himself, that he would take up that cross willingly so that we could be saved and that he defeated death so that we can live. Father, forgive us of our shame, of being embarrassed to stand out, May your word today have encouraged us to see Jesus' courage in the way he served through sacrifice and that we would do the same this week. And we don't just pray that 
we would stand up for Christ this week. We ask for opportunities to do it this week. We ask that you'll make us shine like stars in this world so that people will see Jesus in and through us so that they can be saved. Father, work through us for your glory, for our good, and for the good of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.